Donna Cassidy is a professor of art history and American and New England studies at the University of Southern Maine, where she has taught since 1987. She has published widely on modernism and regionalism in early 20th century American art. She is the author of Painting the Musical City, Jazz and Cultural Identity in American Art, 1910 to 1940, and Marsden Hartley, Race, Region, and Nation, and co-author with Elizabeth Finch and Randall Giff Griffey of Marsden Hartley's Maine. The catalog of the exhibition of the same name, which she co-curated at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Colby College Museum of Art, Soon to be retired from USM, she is looking forward to having more time to dedicate to two research projects. She is a guest curator for a 2023 exhibition at the Agunquit Museum of American Art, Shifting Sands, Beaches, Bathers, and Modern Main Art. And she is working on a new book, Looking North, US Artists in Quebec and Atlantic Canada, 1890 to 1940, which examines an unexplored site of artistic interest for early 20th century American artists. I, I didn't bring my reading glasses down, so I apologize if any of that was incorrect. This talk tonight is the, the painter from Maine, Marsden Hartley in Lovell and across the state. Born in Lewiston, Maine, Marsden Hartley gained a reputation as a modernist artist, having spent many years in avant-garde circles in New York, Paris, and Berlin. Yet equally important for Hartley was his identity as a Maine artist. This talk will examine the critical importance of his connections to the state for his art, particularly his summers in Lovell and Stoneham in the first decade of the century. Please welcome Donna Cassidy. And can you get the, turn the lights down yes. in front? So. Yeah, that's good. I, you know, I, I'm probably don't really need my notes so much. <laughs> I think I should be fine. Okay. So as Jen said, um, first of all, can everyone hear me? Okay. What, as, as Jen was saying, this is a talk that's going to focus on Marjan Hartley's work in Maine. Um, since I've worked a great deal of time on Hartley. It's going to be a short talk and I'm trying to really focus, uh, focus my discussion and attention. And I thought given the audience here at the Lovell Public Library that you would might maybe be most interested in his early career and the time he spent here, but particularly the work that he created um, both in the time he was in Lovell and in Stoneham. But I want to give it that work a little bit of a broader perspective as well by connecting it to his later representations of Maine and the way that this early period really shaped how he thought about Maine. And there are definitely themes that carry over from the early to late period in, in Maine as well. I think one of the one of the first things that I confronted as a historian looking at Hartley's work is that this is really the kind of art, uh, the kind of art that you're seeing here on the screen that Hartley was best known for. Um, this was certainly true when I first started working on Hartley as an artist, um, when I was a very young scholar in the early 1890s, uh, not 1890s, I'm sorry, 1990s, <laughs> um, but also, um, you know, over the course of, of my career, I was most interested in looking at his main, main art. This kind of art though, this avant-garde, modernist, abstract work, the kind of work that he created when he was in Paris and Berlin, when he was connected to artistic circles, um, artists who were exploring cubism and, um, and expressionism, this is the kind of art he's producing. This work, Lighthouse on the left, Portrait of a German Officer on the right. These are abstract portrayals of, of the world. And particularly if you look at Portrait of a German Officer, these are emblems connected with a particular figure, particular person, Carl von Freiburg, 
whom Hartley, um, whom Hartley knew. Um, but the periods that he was in Maine, the periods that he was, was in Maine were equally important in his career. And Maine was a, a really important part of his life. When he spent the first decade, the first kind of productive artistic decade of his life in the, in the early 20th century in Maine, um, and in late, the late part of his career from 1937 to 1943, he was also primarily working in Maine, creating art about Maine. So his career is really bracketed by these two periods that focus on, in which he focuses on Maine, in which he lives in Maine. And you can see here on the screen, an early self-portrait on the left, um, a later photograph of Hartley when he was living in Korea, Maine. Um, but his connections to Maine were even broader. And I just wanna kind of quickly run through those experiences, those connections, those times he was in the state. He was actually born in Maine. He was born in Lewiston, Maine. Uh, his father was an immigrant from England who came to Lewiston to work in the mills. You see a, a family portrait early on, um, around 1910 on the left. And over, um, over on the right is a photograph of one of the many houses that the Hartley family lived in, um, lived in in the late part of, uh, of the 19th century. Hartley himself, by the way, was born in 1877. Um, so this was one of the kind of early houses, early homes that he had in, uh, in Maine. Um, Hartley's mother died when Hartley was eight years old. And um, his narrative, his kind of family experience um, dramatically changes. Uh, he initially lives with one of his sisters in Auburn, Maine, and then eventually relocates to Cleveland with his father and stepmother, um, where he had his first artistic training. Um, one of the teachers that he had in Cleveland um, saw real potential in Hartley and helped to support his artistic training in New York, because of course, New York was the center of the art world. It was that where art students would go to get the most excellent training during that time period. And he, as a student, um, studied in um, the New York um, School of Art with artists like William, uh, William Merritt Chase. Um, and he also, I think, um, was trained at the National Academy of Design. Like many artists working in New York at the turn of the century, in the late decades of the, the 19th century, he was an artist who was learning a lot about Impressionism, about doing landscape painting, right? Going out into nature, studying nature, painting outdoors, or what the Impressionists, French Impressionists would call en plein air. So it was not, uh, it was not uncommon at this time for those Impressionist artists and art students to come to New England in the summertime. And Hartley follows these artists, in a sense, follows them back to his own home. Uh, his initial re-entry to Maine is in 1900. He goes, um, he, he is in Lewiston, that first um, re-entry. I'm not sure how much landscape painting he was actually able to do uh, at this time, but he does, um, does serve and does work as an art teacher or tries to develop a career as an art teacher in, uh, in Lewiston. From 1900 to 1911, Hartley spends at least part of a few months of each year in May. Um, not only in Lewiston, um, he, also, um, he also spends time at, uh, at, in North Bridgeton uh, with the uh, School of the Art Colony of, of Curtis, and, uh, Curtis and Perry. And he, again, begins to build these connections with uh, with, with Maine. Um, he is um, at this time, this is a photograph of him um, in Lewiston actually around, 19, around 1910. And he um, goes to, uh, goes to uh, Hewn Oaks in Lovell in those first years of the century, um, spending time, I think, uh, you know, 1902, 19 to 1904. And he is connecting with some of the artists that are in the community here and particularly Douglas and Marion Volk, and you see Hewn Oaks, an early photograph on the top, and a photograph of Marion Volk and a Mrs. Farnham weaving. And of course, the Volks were really involved in uh, 
kind of uh, resurrection of folk arts and crafts during this, this particular time period. So Hartley's, you know, coming to Maine, but he is, you know, is a, a retreat from the art world of New York, but he's also encountering other artists uh, when he comes to Maine as well. In 1907, he's in Elliott, Maine, in the spiritualist mystical center at Green Acre. Um, he, excuse me, he also, um, of course, spends time in Stoneham, Maine in 19, between 1908 and 11. It's thought that this was the, the hut in St North Stoneham that he stayed in all, at various times during um, I, this kind of periodic residence during this, this particular time period. This is actually a uh, photograph from a- brawl or something, give it a couple of days. Excuse me. Can everybody mute themselves, please? <laughs> So at the at the end of um, or 19, 1911, by 1911, Hartley's starts career starts to take a different direction. Um, and, and between 1911 and the time he makes his second return to Maine in 1937, he only comes back to Maine for periodical family visits. Um, he does spend a summer season at the Agunquit Art Colony. And here you have a, a postcard from the early 20th century showing that colony, particularly the studios of the Robert Laurent group. And in 1928, he spends time with artists like, uh, like Paul Strand and the Zorax in Georgetown, Maine. And this is a photograph from that time period. But by and large, from 1911 to 1937, Hartley is really an artist on the go. He's traveling. He's a cosmopolitan artist, right? He's working in Paris and Berlin. Um, he's in Mexico and Nova Scotia. He's in different parts of the United States. But by the 1930s, during the depression, the art world, the New York art world, the American art world is really creating a different demand on or presenting a different demand for artists to be more American, right? So it became impossible for him by the mid 1930s to- Hi, how are you? I'm doing fine. Uh, can, can, um, can everybody make sure that they're muted on Zoom? Thank you. Oh, well. Um, so by the 1930s, Hartley is really encouraged um, by his, his, his patron, um, Alfred Stieglitz, to really reconnect himself with American oh, places. And so for him, the logical place to go was to return to Maine. So in 1937, until the end of his career in 1943, he spends a good part of every year in Maine, um, eventually settling in Korea, Maine, along the coast, living as a border with the young family in Korea at this time. So this is a general outline of, of where Hartley was, his specific connections to Maine. But I really wanna look at, you know, what was the kind of art that he was- uh, Lana, can I just- Yes. If you're, if you're sharing slides, we keep, they're not changing for us on the Zoom. Can you advance those? The talk is now. I thought the meeting was now. Oh my God. Are you kidding me? Oh, sure. <laughs> oh my God. And Naomi, I'm not sure how to, uh, you know. No. You're, you're not sure? It's, it's just advancing the slides. It sounded like this in the gallery. Oh, Can I find the library yet? Well, I was there, but now I'm nervous that I. They I were don't sharing want to. the screen. Oh, I can, I can this. I'm sorry, we're just having people in the chat go, I can't see the slides. Naomi, is it, is it, um, well, if you are the. I designed the house on the West Side Road, too. So. so. Naomi, can you mute everyone as the. I can't. Yes, it's, it's a lovely, lovely place. <laughs> Let me see if I can do this. If it's... I just have to ask you to unmute now, Donna. Yeah. 
There you Can go. Can you hear me now, Naomi? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I select that one. Can you see the screen now? I can, thank you. That's very helpful. Do, I'm just trying to see, does it advance though? I can't even advance now myself. There it advanced. Yeah. Then it went back. Is this there going now? Yep. Yep. yep, yep, okay. It's going now, yes. I know we've been moving here, but they haven't oh, been able to see it. So there was a, a, a little bit of a glitch. Thank, thank you, I really appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, so can this disappear at the top? <laughs> All right. You can X out the live transcript. I can, I don't, I'm not seeing it on my screen. So I don't know why this is, um, because it's got to, It's all right. That's good. That's good. So it's not. Is everybody happy now? <laughs> okay. Now make sure that works. All right. Let me just get back to where I was. All right. So anyway, where am I? Where are we? Um. So I basically want to look at some of the art that Hartley produced the, during the time he was in Maine, particularly to look at, you know, what was his image of Maine? What was his idea of Maine? What did he focus on? And how did he paint Maine? Because I think, you know, one of the things that, um, in the art world anyway, um, art historians often see New York as you know the, the happening place, modernism, abstract art as the art that really had weight and meaning. And people that went to Maine or the provinces were somehow provincial, right? That their art was not as substantive. But one of the things I think that we see with Hartley's work um, is that in Maine, he's really producing art that is connected to international art movements, um, he's creating an idea, an image of Maine that is really informed by his own personal experiences and cultural ideas of what Maine is as well. Um, so I wanna deal with those, those kinds of things as, I'm, as we look at different, different works by Hartley. Um, the painting that you're seeing on the screen here is a work that he's do, he did in this early period and is um, the earliest known painting by Hartley. Um, this is Shady Brook from 1907, which is actually in the Lewiston Public Library. And I'm saying I should act actually um, say this is the earliest known work. I should also ask um, someone in the audience here, Gail Scott, who is doing the catalog resume of Hartley right now and is a prominent um, Hartley scholar, if that is still the case, Gail. I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> uh, are pretty, you know, yeah, fluid. Things are dated. Right, right. There are some things that are dated, right? Um, but it, it really, to me, is a painting that indicates where Hartley was coming from in those early years, right? He, as I said, was trained, being trained in New York as an art student. He was being taught by artists who were connected to the realists and a pre impressionist approach to landscape painting. So it's a, a landscape that, you know, isn't crisp crisply detailed, right? It's not photographic. Um, and that would have certainly been true of the academic styles of the time. Instead, we really see you know, a style where you can see all the brushwork very evident in the foreground of the painting. It's certainly a work that shows that realist approach. The artist standing before nature, probably painting outdoors and sketching very quickly what he sees. This is a painting that um, certainly doesn't show the brilliant outdoor colors of Impressionist art, but it is that realist Impressionist tradition that I think he's really drawing from in this, in this painting. Even compositionally, it's very much like this painting by Dennis Miller Bunker uh, called The Pool in Medfield from 18, 1889. 
Bunker was a prominent Boston artist during this time period and Hartley develops through his main connections, um, not only these connections to New York, but connections to artists in Boston, who I think were very influential on his early, um, his early career. And I think you can see the same similar kind of compositional format, the loose, uh, very loose brush, brushwork that still, still feels realistic. We can still identify the scene. It's a scene that has a sense of depth and space to it, um, but we're getting to a style that is less crisp and detailed, which was the academic style common in the 19th century. The style that Hartley, one of the styles that Hartley really develops in his time in Lovell and Stoneham is very much exemplified by the painting that you're seeing here on the screen, Carnival of Autumn from, from 1908. It is a painting in many ways that's beyond impressionism. It's not just about describing what the artist sees in a kind of sensory momentary um, capturing of light and atmosphere. It is a painting that is less concerned with naturalism and naturalistic description and more about exploring um, brilliant colors um, and the connection between um, co different colors, the, the way colors react when placed next to one another, color theory. Um, this was one of the ideas that really dominated post-impressionism or neo-impressionism in the late 19th and early, early 20th century. So post-impressionism, this interest in a much more non-naturalistic style is what we see in Carnival of Autumn. And Hartley also becomes very intrigued by a much more you know, mystical, um, spiritual approach to nature, not so much, again, interested in the surface descriptions of nature, but the idea that there's this, this mood, feeling, spirit underlying the natural world. And by using a much more abstract style, he felt he was able to achieve that. And of course, some of you um, might recognize this as very familiar to the locale in which you are in, in, Lo in Lovell and Stoneham. Um, Keyser Lake with the mountains in the, in the background. But you can see the way that Hartley here is not, I mean, this is a work by Willard Metcalf, which is a, he's a very typical impressionist artist. And yeah, you have that broken brushwork, you have intense light, but there's still the sense of depth, you know, the, the colors, the, the blues and the, uh, the blues and purples in the distance create a sense of depth into the composition. The houses are described, you know, as though they're in kind of linear perspective and have depth to them. Hartley's work happens much more on the surface, right? There's a sense of a lake and the mountains kind of compressing into the, a single plane. And I would argue certainly that the way that we see any sense of space in here is through the vibrant contrast of the colors, right? The yellows jumping out, the blues <laughs> receding, and that, that kind of tension. Uh, there's really, you know, not that same kind of depth. And again, that brings us to, you know, his interest really in a much more post-impressionist style and not so much that naturalistic based style of, um, of, of Metcalf and other impressionist artists. Um, oops, sorry. One of the um, kind of, uh, one of the influences certainly that we see in this, in Hartley's tendency here to flatten the picture plane is his interest in the arts and crafts movement. And artists like Arthur Wesley Dow in this landscape painting of Ipswich, Massachusetts, again, another Boston-based artist who Hartley would have been um, familiar with. Um, his style is very different, but you can see how, how Dow here is really using these flat, broad areas of, of color on the surface. And, Hartley is certainly doing this as well um, in this composition. His style is obviously really different. Hartley has this dense painterly surface. You saw this painting and you actually can see it. It's at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It's one of, you know, a work that's um, somewhat available. 
Um, but the whole surface is just like this dense buildup of paint. And you really that's <laughs> you really become aware of that as you're looking at, at looking at this this work. Um, and that arts and crafts connection um, is something I think worth noting and extending. Um, one of the um, one of the scholars I worked with on the Hartley, um, Hartley's main show, Beth French, who really did a lot of work on the level period. Um, Beth argues that, that these early works are in a sense very similar to the weaving that um, Marion Volk did and Hartley's interest in, in, in looking at that process of making textiles that he would have encountered in, at Hugh Noakes. And it's something that Hartley um, you know, commented on later and you certainly get a sense of that dense surface and the layered and the, almost the way that the brushwork kind of inter, interweaves um, one with the other. And that really connects with the, you know, another source often identified um, for Hartley during this period. And that is the Swiss um, post-impressionist or neo-impressionist um, Giovanni Sagantini. Um, this is a work by him on the right called Death in the Alps from 1896, 1899. It's a, it's a work, it's an artist um, whom Hartley came in contact with through, um, work, through illustrations. He was very interested in his work. And again, you can see this kind of long stitch-like stroke. Uh, you can even see it a little bit. Um, and there's a Segantini reproduction on the screen. And Segantini was best known for this stitch stroke. So again, this idea of weaving, of stitching, brushwork on the surface was something that Hartley um, encountered in different ways by uh, and through artists like this international artist, uh, well-known artist Sagantini, and through perhaps these encounters in places like Lovell and Stoneham and figures like, like Marion, Marion Volk. Um, one of the other things I might say about Hartley's interest in Sagantini, Sagantini was known really as a painter of mountains, right? And the mountains of Northern Europe. Um, and this was something that he would have been really attracted to as he was here in Lovell and Stoneham painting the same things. And I've all, also always been very struck by this particular kind of cloud formation in the Hartley compared to the, the Sagantini um, as well. Uh, nowhere, by the way, do we see Hartley uh, as a, a better example of Hartley as this experimental modern artist um, in these, this first decade of the 20th century in Lovell and Stoneham, then in a whole series of almost abstract landscape paintings. This one, uh, most dramatically, made woods from, from 1908. Um, you might even think or have thought it was an abstract work until you start, until I start to say, well, these are actually birch trees, right? Mm -hmm. And you can see some small cottages down below, but he's really, he really shows a very different kind of experience of nature here. He is looking at those details of nature, not the big scene and trying to create depth and that panoramic view, but you are, thrown into the density of color, the density of the, the woods and forests, that it was part of the environment that he's painting here. And again, brilliant colors, contrasting colors here that show the way that Hartley was really learning a lot from many of the new post-impressionist artists and, and other modernist artists working at the time. You can see how far a work like that is from another Metcalf um, Impressionist painting of Birches here um, from 19, 1906. And again, you can see the way that Hartley's really, through these main works of the early part of the century, really throwing himself into this world of avant-garde art. This is a, another work that he did in, uh, in Lovell Stoneham area in the first decade of the century called Autumn Cascade. And on the right is a work by a French Fauvist artist, um, Maurice Blamont, um, Bank of the, of the Sens at Chateau uh, from 1905, 1906. And you know, 
this is this is a painting that um, you know is a very evocative, very much like those those formal, almost abstract experimentation that you see on the part of European artists, uh, modernist artists around this, this same time. Um, so these, you know, these, these early works, um, they're really showing the way that Hartley's embracing nature in Maine, the power of nature, the mysticism of nature, um, trying to create paintings that more, are more about the experience of being in nature and not just describing the natural world, but kind of what is it like to be in these spaces and trying to create, uh, and if not evoke um, the way or evoke that feeling in the colors and the forms that he is using. And we certainly see that in another work, uh, not the brightly colored autumnal scenes, but the darker tones that you see that we see in a whole series of winter nighttime paintings that he does in Lovell and Stoneham as well. This is Winter Chaos Blizzard from 1909. And again, we're thrown into this, this painting in the midst of sweeping and curving lines and the, the tumult of the brushstroke, the swirl of the brushstroke um, throughout the composition. He is trying to evoke here what it's like to be in a blizzard. Not, not describing it, but fe the feeling of it, an equivalent really of being in that natural experience, that natural environment of winter, of winter time. And I think, you know, what we, as I said, what we see in a, in a whole series of these early, um, these early level Stoneham paintings is a darkening of the palette. And, you know, this gets to another point about Hartley's main works. I mean, Hartley had a very, you know, ambivalent, had very ambivalent feelings about Maine. He loved it. He hated it. He had lots of, you know, personal uh, experiences like, you know, the death of his mother, the, the rupture of his family. He certainly um, also as a young gay man, in Maine may have um, experienced a sense of being on the outside of, of being here as well. And of course, Maine in the late 19th and early part of the century was a state in decline. Economically, I mean, the mills were changing, um, the farmland was being, uh, was being abandoned. Um, farmers were you know, out migrating to um, to the Midwest, where land was much more, uh, much more uh, available, um, industrialized agriculture was much more common, and so Maine was really kind of a depressing place to be at this time. And you have this image of a a Maine in decline, a New England in decline um, during this time period as well. And it's no surprise that we find another kind of theme, another kind of way of looking at Maine during this time period and a whole series of landscapes that have become known or were known even at the time as the dark landscapes. Um, these are, again, paintings that were inspired by his experiences in Stoneham. Um, he wasn't painting directly in front of the landscape here. He wasn't doing what the Impressionist landscape painters did, going and painting on plein air. This series of the dark landscapes were actually painted from memory of his impressions of the landscape and landscapes in this area of Maine when he was in his studio in New York. So these are landscapes of memory, landscapes of the imagination and not the, again, those kind of descriptive landscapes of nature. The dark mountain of, of 19, 1909, I think really embodies that, that mournful, um, a bleak quality of, of life in Maine in this time period. And he has this, you know, this wall of the mountain that just really comes up and creates a kind of curtain or cloak of darkness and that really fills almost the entire canvas. Um, his palette is very limited and you can see how really different this is. This is not the light Maine, the colorful Maine of many of those 
a post-impressionist work, this is a much, has a much darker tone. And I don't know if you can see this very well, but it's these trees that kind of you know, take on their own life, have these branches that kind of almost reach out um, into the landscape and these tiny houses that are dwarfed by the height of these, this dark mountain, right? In the, in, the, in the background and in the distance. These landscapes were really inspired, not just by his idea of Maine, but also by his experience um, seeing a, a late 19th century uh, landscape and seascape artist, um, Albert Pinkham Ryder in New York around 19, 1909. He sees an exhibit of Ryder's work. Um, this is uh, one of the paintings that he specifically uh, would talk about and write about. And Ryder worked with this these dark, um, these dark tones, um, limited palette, and there's a kind of almost a, you know, a haunting quality um, to the landscapes that he that he produced. And so you can see the way that this is a, a strong inspiration uh, for Hartley in this series of of uh, dark landscapes from the um, late late part of the first decade from 1909 to 1910 that he's working in this particular manner. This is another example, deserted farm that explicitly through the title identifies that experience, right? Of Maine with the out migration of farmers, um, the, uh, even the out migration of people um, away from the centers of of industry as well as agriculture during this time period. And you see some of that same compositional structure, that, that wall of dark mountains, the small houses below that, that are really dwarfed by um, almost, um, you know, weighted down by the, the darkness of, of the landscape as well. Before I leave this early period, I wanna just, also introduce a, a couple of other themes or another theme that was part of Hartley's early period. He did in a series of drawings of this time, focus on people, um, the folk, um, the people of Maine. Um, here are two examples, um, Hartley's old maid crocheting from 1908, an old man in a rocking chair on 1908, well, and you know, you can almost see that he's translating here into pencil, right? That style of his painting. And it, to me, it always looks like a, a parallel even to someone like Van Gogh, you know, those long streaks of color that are here, that frenetic brushwork that's translated into this very frenetic and energetic uh, pencil work. In these, in these particular uh, portraits, so these particular paintings. They're not portraits of anyone in particular. They really though are very much exemplary of regional types during this time. The spinster, the old woman, the old man. I mean, there are paintings and photographs of New England and Maine in the late 19th and early 20th century that again, suggest the decline of this place through these old, the old age of its inhabitants or the conservative nature of the inhabitants. This is a, a photograph by <coughs> Walt Snudding, trimming the pie crust. Nutting did all sorts of these kind of colonial women, right? In the interior, um, not unlike the old woman crocheting that we see in Hartley's uh, drawing or Eastman Johnson, uh, another Maine born artist here, um, in this case painting Nantucket School of Philosophy from 1887, all these old New Englanders sitting around and you know, trying to purvey or talk about wisdom. Um, and they really exemplify an old way of life. Uh, New England and Maine um, during this time was really you know, seemed to be a place that was in the past, right? It wasn't seen to be part of a vital America. Um, and this is something I think there's a flavor of this in these works and certainly in Hartley's drawings. Although among these drawings that he does, he also presents, you might say, a different type for the Mainer, 
uh, for the New Englander. And that's certainly evident in this drawing of chopping wood, also from 19, 1908. The kind of physical, masculine, vital um, worker, right, that the folk that becomes a, a part of his writing, um, a part of his um, early drawings. He is, um, by the way, Hartley would go on later to write about uh, Wesley Adams, one of the woodsmen of, um, of I think it was, uh, it was of Lovell. Around this time, he met him and greatly admired um, him as an individual and his dedication to this physical way of life. And again, this sense of um, celebrating this kind of physical masculine vitality, um, historians have also connected to his, um, the fact that Hartley was gay and had a kind of attraction um, to this powerful physical man that he encountered in Maine, both in the early and later part of his career. But he is kind of proposing a different type, a suggestion of an alternative to the old men and the old women um, in the chairs that he is also drawing this time. And again, this gets back to another point about Hartley, and that is that for him, Maine was not just one place. It was multiple places. It was both a positive and negative place. It was filled with light. It was filled with darkness. It had this, you know, conservatism looking back to the past. And it also had this, this powerful, vital folk. And this, these are the kinds of parameters. These are kinds of ideas about Maine that he really sets out in the early part of his career, when he's in Lovell, when he's in Stoneham. And it's a Maine that he would reinvigorate and reconnect with in the later part of his career. So in the last couple of minutes here that I, I wanna talk, I just wanna show you the way that this early period um, is a period that would really shape Hartley's later representations of Maine. Um, the first example is an example of, of paintings that he did when he was in Paris in 1924. So here's Hartley in Paris in 1924 among the avant-garde um, at this time, um, but he did a whole series of landscape paintings that included works like these, these paysage, um, the landscapes that are main landscapes. They are very much like those dark landscapes, right? That he, that he painted in 1909, 19, through 1911, when he was in, in Stoneham. He's in Paris and he had photographs of some of these, these paint, earlier paintings. And he's being encouraged, certainly by the Parisians, by art critics there who are say, asking you know, him to do something American. He is also being very much encouraged by some of his close colleagues, uh, not least of which was Alfred Stieglitz, his patron, but also one of the leading critics of the Stieglitz circle to which Hartley belonged, right? Um, the critic Paul Rosenfeld in 1924 writes a chapter about Hartley in his book called The Port of New York, calling on Hartley to make those reconnections back to me. And so, you know, there's this confluence of things um, in, when he's in Paris that move him back to recall, to recollect those earlier works and that earlier time period in Maine. Um, and this connection back to Maine and this, you might even say, demand on uh, the part of critics and patrons that Hartley make those reconnections back to Maine is something that would become, um, you know, would become inevitable for him in the 1930s. Again, in the context of the depression, when so many artists were reconnecting with American places, finding their roots again, uh, the very famous uh, regionalist artist of the 1930s, Thomas Hart Benton, who was primarily a New York artist until 1936. And he said, I'm going back home to Missouri. And this kind of exodus from New York was really typical of the time. And Hartley kind of joined that group of, of artists who were connecting, reconnecting back with their 
their native, native land. So Hartley from 1937 to 1943 really makes a name for himself as the painter from Maine. And he was very um, conscious about doing that. He did it in many ways. He wrote a lot about Maine. He published poems about Maine and created lots of works that um, were both similar and different from those earlier paintings that I just showed you. Um, this is a work by him called Off the Banks at Night that he did in 1942 that I hope you can see is clearly like many of those darker landscapes. Here, of course, focused on um, the seascape in many ways, evoking Albert Pinkham Ryder again in this, in this work. Um, it is a dark landscape, a dark seascape with mournful, um, mournful colors. Um, it is also a seemingly very dangerous landscape. Uh, these rocks here that have these pointed saw-like edges to them that, um, that really speak to the destructive force of, of nature. So um, it's a work, as I said, this is a mournful painting and in many ways it's a painting as much about Maine and the coast and the dangerous life of, of fisher folk as it is about his earlier experiences in Nova Scotia, where he lived with a family, um, two of the sons of the family and their cousin were drowned. Um, and these were people that Hartley was very close to. And again, there's a memory of that. And he was connecting that experience certainly to what was happening in Maine and um, Maine culture. And you know, he is in 1942 living in Korea, Maine, which was very near Winter Harbor where there was a naval post, a naval, um, yeah, but Navy, Navy uh, base. base, thank you, <laughs> a Navy base, um, and during the war where he became again much, uh, much aware of that, that fact and the dangers of the war connected to this and connecting to even his earlier experiences of of war and death, that very first painting I showed you, Portrait of a German Officer, was really dedicated mm -hmm. um, to Carl von Freiburg, who is a friend, perhaps a, perhaps a lover, who died in the first months of World War I. So this sense of mournfulness, I think, is really part of this image, and again, part of his idea of Maine, of Maine as well. But he also had these really powerful, positive images of the state. Um, this is one of the many paintings that he did of Mount Katahdin. This one of Autumn number two from 1939 to 1940. And it's like and, and not like those earlier Stoneham and uh, Lovell paintings, right? You see similar compositions, you know, the flattening of the mountain against the lake. Um, the colors here though are more flatly painted. Um, there's, you know, a kind of focus more on, on shape than there was in the early, uh, early paintings, but there's still lots of brilliant color. Um, it's really interesting too that, you know, Hartley um, first becomes, the first starts thinking about painting Katahdin when he's in Germany in the early part of the 1930s. In 1934, 1930, uh, 1933, 34, he's in Southern Germany in a small town, Garmisch Partenkirchen. And when he was there, he, you know, he's in this alpine village where you walk the streets and the, the mountains surround you. And it would have evoked those earlier times in, in Lovell and, and Stoneham and had him thinking about other places and projects that he could work on um, as part of his painting. And so when he comes back to Maine in the late thirties, um, he, he turns to Katahdin and Katahdin had lots of historical associations connected with Henry David Thoreau, um, connected to um, Abnaki, native culture in the, in the region. These were things that Hartley himself noted, who wrote about these connections and saw himself as part of that tradition as well. Um, I love this photograph of him that was in the Bangor Daily News in 1940. I'm standing with exactly that painting that I just showed you. Um, and he's here and showing himself not as that cosmopolitan artist, right, um, in Paris. And he's showing himself really as one of the main folk, right? He's got this flannel 
shirt on, standing next to Katad. He's identifying himself with Maine as place. This was very much a, a part of his late project, his project from 1937 to 1943. And the focus on the Maine folk was really part of that late, um, that late period as well. This is one of the many paintings of, of the folk that he did at this time. Um, here, young hunter hearing call to arms from around 19, 1939, um, focusing on, again, aspects of regional culture here. This is a work too in subject that harkens back to those early 1908 drawings that I showed you, focusing on the folk, the strength, the masculine vitality. This is a blocky figure, the thick neck, broad um, geometric face here. Um, look at those hands, you know, these are, you know, not delicate hands, but really, you know, massive fingers, massive hands, um, he has a L.L. Bean hunting hat with him on the side. Although this is a this is also a painting that's very evocative. It's blonde and blue eyed. He's got this shirt and vest on that evokes kind of um, you know Germanic folk attire. Um, and Hartley did make lots of connections between the folk in Maine, the folk in Germany that he encountered in a way that um, certainly had racial inflections. And this is something I've, I've written a lot about um, um, in various, various publications, that sense that um, he really saw these, um, these main types, these main folk as representing a kind of new race, a new possibility of regenerating Maine. So there's this kind of hopeful note in these powerful masculine figures and again, an erotic tone in many of these works as well. Um, this is a, a work that was uh, a lobster fisherman that he did in uh, Korea, Maine, and focusing on these massive, muscular, uh, blocky, you don't really see their muscles here, but they're blocky, they're big, they're kind of massive um, figures in shape, and even kind of you know, showing off their, their physique, this uh, arms akimbo, um, presenting themselves on the deck here, and um, particularly a figure on the left who seems over life size um, compared to the other figures. And the last figure that I will show you is, remains one of my favorite. Uh, and this is um, Canuck Yankee Lumberjack at Old Orchard Beach, Maine from 1940 to 41. And it's, you know, again, a much more, I think, overtly erotic and sexual image and, you know, uh, Randy Griffey and I have both, both written about the way that, um, and Jonathan Weinberg have written about the way that, that Hartley in coming to Maine, you know, as a gay man, you know, found spaces and places where he could paint the male body, look at the male body with impunity because, you know, you're on older Orchard Beach and what does everybody do, right? You look at other bodies on the beach. And this was a space that he um, felt that he could explore the male body as type um, is this lumberjack, um, this swimmer that we see here. Again, hardly working here, not described in a descriptive realistic style, but exaggerating um, the figure. You have this broad chest, but you know, you see the genitals here, lots of hair, the sexual, secondary sexual characteristics that really emphasize the figure fills the composition. And you know that 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 sexuality, but also that sense of you know the people uh, of Maine, the variety of people in Maine is something that we see in many of these late works. I want to add too that you know the Old Orchard Beach at this time was really known as the Coney Island of New England, where the, you know it's kind of risque behavior, and you know you get a little bit of this in this work and Hartley. Uh, wrote to a friend in 1938. He said, I do want so much to swing out a little in August and go down to Old Orchard for a few days as it seems too bad not to enjoy so lovely a spectacle as that five mile beach covered with handsome humanity. Mm -hmm. And you get this sense certainly um, in this particular painting of exactly what attracted him um, to, to this place. So this is just a little bit of a flavor of, of Hartley's work, um, the range of work that he did over, over his career. 
um, the way that his experiences in, in Maine were really um, strongly grounded in that first period um, in, from 1900 to 1911, in which he sets out to be an artistic experimenter, um, someone who explores Maine as a subject matter. And this is certainly something that would continue to interest him throughout his career and particularly that late period when he made a very strong effort to identify himself as the painter from Maine. So that's it, thank you. Yes. I would just like to add that one of the slides you showed of his art studio in West Stoneham that he referred to as the hut. Yes. In West Stoneham, there is a road called the Hut Road. So I'm sure that that is where yeah. it leads yeah. to the Hut Road. Yeah. Nice for you to know that. I'm a Stoneham resident. So nice <laughs> to know that. Thank you. Should I stop sharing in case there's any questions on Zoom? Yeah. Um, if you have a question on Zoom, perhaps you could drop it into the chat. That would be that's a good idea, Naomi. I'm not seeing anything come up, so okay. Please feel free to take questions in the room. Yep. Um, well, I have a couple questions, but my first question is, did, did anything in his childhood, um, you know, um, inspire him as an artist? I, I, know, I know he had some trauma in his childhood, but when did his artistic talent start to show? Um, from my understanding, it's really when he's in Cleveland um, and he begins to become interested in art at that point. I don't know, Gail, if you have any more insights during um, You know, his autobiography talks about sketching. Um, and the, uh, but it's, it's in Lewiston. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, it, it, you know, in the environments of Lewiston, he would find, uh, he would do sort of botanical studies with yeah. uh, little insects and butterflies. Which is really typical, these kind of botanical studies and as a way of learning about art during this time. And I'm also remembering that one of the things he talked mostly about was reading, like going to the Lewiston Library when he was a young kid. So, you know, he Hartley does have this really, um, you know, poetic style or side to him, right? Um, where he he has he wrote poetry throughout his career in life. He wrote essays, so he's you know he has that identity as well. Um, and that reading part of him is something that I think also very much informs his work. I mean that that interest. Um, one of the one of the things he talks about as again in his autobiography as being a moment of great inspiration was reading. Emerson, you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson. So it's interesting to think about that, you know, some artists are really influenced by something visual that they are seeing, but also, um, and I think this is especially true for Hartley, there's this interest in the word and how that kind of shapes the way he begins to think about his art. And uh, there's always this reading the letters. I mean, there's, you know, there are always these, you know, books, I'm reading this, I'm reading that, as much as there is about I'm seeing this and seeing that mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So he was able to support himself through his art. He was kind of able, I mean, not really. I think, you know, by his late career is really when he becomes most successful in a way. And that lobster fisherman painting that I showed you, he won an award at the Met Museum, a Victory Medal Award. Um, he actually had money in the bank when he died. Um, this was not, this, there was a real struggle always for him, I think. And a uh, tension between him and his, his major patron, which was for many years, Alfred Stieglitz, who even in the 1920s was beginning to encourage him to come back to Maine because 
modernism, the Stieglitz circle that, that Hartley was associated with, the artists that were associated with this group in the teens, by the 20s, they really begin to start painting modernist realist, I mean, you know, realist representational subjects, but, um, but also recognizable. So you have artists like George O'Keefe, for example, who's also part of the Stiegler circle, whose, whose works in the teens are very experimental. By the tw 20s and certainly by the 30s, she's painting, you know, New Mexico. Um, the 30s, the 20s, she's of course doing a lot of experimentation. She's actually in York Beach, Maine. She's in the Gaspé. But she, again, identifies herself with place. Or someone like John Marin, um, also a member of the Stieglitz group, very stylistically experimental and almost abstract works in the teens. By the 20s, he's connected to Maine or connected to New York City. And, you know, Stiglitz is able to sell him in that way. I mean, there's a big, you know, he was able to sell one of Stiglitz, I'm sorry, one of Marin's watercolors in 1925 to Duncan Phillips for like five or $6,000, which is quite a, lot, quite a lot of money at that time. So. Um, so there was this, this tension always in Hartley, we kind of say, okay, yeah, maybe I'll come back to New England. He did come back to and spend some time in Gloucester in the late, in the early 30, early thirties, but he, you know, he's happier in some ways, not in the United States, but he was also not always a happy person. He was, you know, he, my, the, the kind of pattern was he'd move someplace new, um, really love it do some work and then say, oh, I can't stand this place anymore and like, move, on, move on. So there, there's that pattern. And I think um, that that was not kind of sustainable in some ways, but he did manage to get support from Stieglitz and other patrons. Mm -hmm. The 30s, he was much more successful because his work somewhat aligned with larger interests in the culture and in the art world of the time as well. I want to say, you know, he just had really bad luck too. You know, he did all these German officer paintings in 1914 and 15 when he's in Berlin, which were really, really fabulous paintings. But then he brings, this is the middle of World War I, brings them back to New York and tries, you know, there's no audience. There's, you know, so there, there are these, there are a number of these moments throughout his career where there's, you know, there, whoa, it's just not working out, working out for him. Yeah. Did the Volks, did the Volks? I don't know that I think he is, began to explore the region initially uh, in Bright in um, North Bridgeton and with um, with Curtis and Perry and their their art colony there and I think he just came he came back the next year he began to like this particular um, area I don't know if the Volks deliberately enticed him but he, they he certainly encountered them here when he was when he was here. The artists that were there at Dune Oaks. Are there notes on? on oh, I don't know. I haven't done enough work in depth on the the Dune Oaks colony. Um, so I was that an auction when they sold all of the <coughs> and the auctioneer had found a, a Milton Avery drawing. Yeah. Off yeah. The steps. Yeah. Of her. So yeah. most likely he was there. I just wondered if there were notes of, of other. I haven't looked at deeply enough into the into the papers, and there are some Volk papers at the Archives of American Art, but I haven't looked in great detail at them. I mean, I think it's I think that is a really interesting story that has not been told. I mean, just even the whole arts and crafts revival that they're part of um, is I think there's only just beginning to be some scholarly interest in that. And I know my colleague Beth Finch, who did, did some work on the Volks um, and Hartley, um, was hoping to do some more work on that. Um, I'm not sure she's had enough time to do it, but that she did have that in mind, really feeling that there were some important connections there. And I think there were also, you know, also female artists who were involved with that project. And I think that in the present moment, there's a lot more attention to Media like weaving that you know is has often not been part of main narratives of art history. Other other questions? Yeah. Is there anything from his collection available for locally or in Portland? 
Gail Scott is doing <laughs> um, a catalog resume um, sponsored by Bates College Museum of Art. Um, Bates College Museum of Art received what was in Hartley's studio. Um, there are lots of drawings in their collection that are sometimes on view. I don't know if there are things up right now. You, it, there's a good online resource of those works. Um, there is a Katahdin painting at the Agunquit Museum and also one of his Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia works. Um, I think there's a Provence landscape painting that's on view at the Portland Museum of oh, Art oh, right now. Uh, oh, okay, at the PMA, yeah. yeah. Um, so there are, you know, there are a few, a few examples. Um, where to go if there's... Colby, Colby, I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> I should know that. <laughs> uh, Colby does, have, although I don't think there are many up right now because I was, I was up there, but Colby has um, quite a few works in their collection as, as well. It, it's, you know, I think the best way, the best thing to do if you're going to be traveling to any of the local museums to look is to actually go on their website because they all have data databases now and they'll tell you what's on if it's on view. So if you do a Hartley search, um, you can see that. I mean, I think you know the the example I showed you from the the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. There were a, there was another Hartley work, um, one of his um, work kind of abstract works from the from the teens that was also in view the last time that I was there. Um, and most, ma you know, most major museums outside of New England will have works by, by them as well. But those are a few that can kind of get you, get you started. And the base collection drawings is really interesting because they're, you know, they're drawings and you really see a kind of different side. Uh, and there are lots of the, the late figure drawings related to some of his major, major paintings, including drawings of the lumberjack at Old Richard Beach. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you for all your patience.